Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. Yo, it's Elliot back with the Yo Elliot Show or the Elliot Hulse Podcast. And today I got a guess, but I'd like to tell you a little bit more about why I have him here and what we got going on because it's pretty damn cool. So the very first thing you ought to know is that my friend Rich Graham. What's up, Elliot? Right here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure, bro. So, well, we met through Anthony, who was who's the owner of the 21 Convention. He brought me out to your place about four, three, four years ago. I think it was 2018. Yeah to get some firearms training. Yep. Yeah, so Rich is a firearms trainer. He's also a former Navy SEAL. He travels the world teaching police forces, security forces, uh, special forces, uh, guys that protect how to protect better through firearms training and also combat training. I mean, you move like a ninja. So this guy's an all-around badass weapon, and we got some pretty cool things that we're doing to get together. But uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, bro. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's great to be here. Yeah. So after we met, we kind of stayed in touch and started a project together. Yeah. In fact, it was something that was on your heart that you unfolded. And I was so blessed to be a part of it two years ago for the first time. And it's called the Protector's Summit. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about the Protector's Summit and how you came up with the idea and what it's about. Yeah. So the Protector's Summit was essentially... I had been going to a lot of men's leadership conferences myself, business conferences. When I came out of the Navy and I kind of find myself in this position like, well, what do I do now, right? And for essentially seven years, I I turned off the radio um, and just started diving into books on communication and leadership and spirituality and all this kind of stuff. And I traveled around the country and I was going to different seminars and conferences and I, I saw a common theme of like people would come to the conference, they're sitting in an auditorium, they're sitting in a, a convention center or a hotel meeting room, and you're getting filled up with all this information. And a lot of this stuff was like very motivational. Some of the stuff was very educational, but a lot of it was hypothetical at this point. You know what I mean? So for example, when we were at the 21 convention, uh, I remember a very distinct story about a guy who is from Utah and he came from a Mormon uh, community and he's like, dude, I'm a dad now and I'm, you know, almost 40. And I realize I have a couple kids they are getting a little older and I've never been in a fist fight in my life. Mm-hmm. Like I've never been punched in the face. Like I have no idea how to defend my family because I've grown up in this environment that was super safe but now as a protector of my family, like I have, I have no idea what to do. And the cool thing he did was he joined a gym that was a boxing gym. Nice. And he's like, dude, you know what? I'm going to train up and take an amateur boxing match just for the sake of going through the process of learning how to fight, to stand in front of another man and go toe to toe and see what I'm made of. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whether he wins or not, it was the, the point of the process. And everyone who is in the audience, there was a lot of people in the audience who I bet had never been in a fight either. Right. Or if they did, maybe they're on the losing end. They never actually trained for one. You know what I mean? So in this, it was like he had this great story, but everyone was just sitting in the chairs like this, taking notes. But is there actually physical application to this? Right. Right. So did you actually get punched in the face? Exactly. And, so and we go to the protective summit, and the first thing and we, we might do get is punched in the yeah, face. Yeah, the first thing we do when you show up is just punch you right in the face. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. In a way, kind of. In a way, and like, um, so you show up, and again, another side of this was, in my experience, this isn't everyone's experience because the SEAL teams are each team has its own identity, each platoon. Uh, task unit, whatever troop, um, the names have changed over the years, but the, each group has its own identity as well. 
And huh. my experience when I was there at the team, I was surrounded by a lot of guys who were great at fighting, but didn't have like, there's, there wasn't a lot of like spirituality there. There wasn't, we had one dude out of my 30 something guys who would sit down every day and read the Bible. And we'd all look at him like he was crazy. You know what I mean? Like the one right. dude reading the Bible is the crazy guy. Right. right. And you know, no one gave him a hard time for it. You just kind of looked over and he was doing his thing and he'd always have a few wide, wise words to say. And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're all just kind of, you know, being meatheads about life, you know, and coming out of the Navy, I realized there was this, there was this gap there and there was something missing still. And this is one right. of the reasons why I turned off the TV, turned off the radio, right. And just started diving into you know, this quest of, of knowledge, you know what I mean? I didn't know right. what, I, I didn't know what I was looking for at the time. I just knew there was something missing. Well, you had spent several years in the Navy. Yeah. And so you're a very skilled man in uh, weaponry and in fighting and stuff. So it almost seems as if you really develop that protector side of yourself, the ability to fight and to protect and to use your body as a weapon. And even as a teacher, I hired you for several, I brought my daughters, I brought my wife, I brought my father, brought all these people out to you for what your unique skill set is and the gift that you bring to the world to teach men how to use weapons and use your body as a weapon. But it sounds almost as if the inner aspect of it or the other side of the coin, which is what you're describing in terms of the man reading the Bible and digging into all of the um, the knowledge that yeah. you are doing so now has been a part of your your fulfillment quest, bringing it all together. Exactly. So there was, there was no balance there. Mm -hmm. You know, I found myself going into like a dark, you know, personal, on my personal side, like emotional, like inside my heart, my heart was getting hardened and hardened and hardened. And I just knew something was wrong. You know what I mean? Like here I am, I've accomplished, you know, what most people dream of accomplishing as far as like uh, military terms of, of, you know, being in a special forces unit and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and I'm driving and aspiring to, to continue to, to, uh, get to higher and higher levels within the special forces community. And then I get a, a medical complication. I threw a 96% blood clot blockage right here in my, my artery right outside my heart. And, uh, it was unfixable. And they did some surgeries and stuff. So all of a sudden here, I've put all this time and energy and focus into doing this one specific thing. And then it was just taken away. Right. And now I'm left sitting there going, now what? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's just me. Like I lost that job. I lost that title. You know, I lost the, that sphere of influence. And, um, so, so in that I, I started trying to figure out wh what to do next. And I knew that there was something missing and again, we talk about that balance mm -hmm. of you can be a protector, right? You can be a fighter, but if there's no spiritual balance to it, right. then what stops you from being the bad guy? You know what I mean? Right. So, um, so in that process, you know, uh, I started developing what. I call the full spectrum warrior philosophy, mm -hmm. right? And that's what I've Can been Can I just teaching. pause you for a yeah. second? Your story reminds me of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Are you familiar with that name? Do you know who he is? Explain. So he was the founder of the Jesuits today, okay. which is a, is, a, is a order within the Catholic Church. And they're known for their rigor. They're known for their precision. They're known for their, well, some of the bad things that they're doing in the world today now. But he started this many years ago, he was a warrior. He was a fighter. He was one of the best. And he put all his eggs in that basket to mm -hmm. be a, continue to be a leader and to rise in the ranks. And then he got a leg injury. Yeah. And he found that he could never go back to battle. And while he was laying his, in bed, he was surrounded by books. And he said, well, why don't I just pick up the Bible and start reading it? Had no sense of doing it beforehand. And then devoted all of his rigor, all of his discipline, all of his commitment, his warrior mindset to the precision of understanding scripture and and God and spent the rest of his life, well, he spent a portion of his life living in a cave, kind of like your, that's yeah. like your cave experience. He, yeah. he, li he lived in a cave for a little while under some austerities, trying to purge himself of his 
carnal lusts and desires and fighting nature in terms of the world and transmuted mutated it into a, a, a fighting spirit for God. It almost sounds like your story is, is a little similar. Yeah, it's, it's interesting now that you say that because during that time, so I come out of the Navy, I don't know what I'm going to do next. And that was like taken away from me. And I basically gave up on that and just, you know, emotionally separated myself from that. And I, and I was just saying, I, I talked to guys who get out of the military now, um, helping with like veteran suicide prevention and, and the mindset and all that stuff of, of changing a job or losing your identity. And it's like, you got to realize, and this is a realization that I came to in this process was, I like to explain it like this. I'm not my, I'm not my job. Right. And if you, you could take whatever job or whatever community that you're a part of and apply this, I'm just going to talk from the SEAL teams. Cause that's my, my, uh, story. Right. If you want to be an architect or if you want to be a singer, if you want to be whatever, it, it could be, you could change out the SEAL title and this process with something else. Mm-hmm. But if you look at someone who is mining for gold, like back in the day in the rivers in, you know, California and, and they're out there with their sifter and they come into the river with a shovel and they just scoop up a whole like a big scoop of mud and earth and rocks and silt and gold and whatever other minerals, gems, whatever, but they're mining for gold. So they take this scoop and they drop it in the sifter and they start sifting out everything that they don't want, right? There goes the silt, there goes the earth and the mud, right? The dirt starts going out. There's some rocks. They start scraping the rocks out And what they're left with is gold. Mm. And people will say, oh, the Navy made you a SEAL, right? And a lot of guys hold on to that. Like, the Navy made me who I am. The SEAL teams made me who I am. And without it, I'm nothing. And it's like, well, the reality is they had 500 of thousands of people were trying out for for my Navy SEAL class. When I showed up, there was probably 450, 300, you know, high 300s, right around 400 people. And we're there training for a month and a half before SEAL training even starts. And half the people quit before we even started. (laughs) But there was thousands of people who got cut from the program before they even got to San Diego during the the tryouts. process. Exactly. So at this point, the Navy didn't make anything. It's identifying people. Wow. Does that make sense? Yeah. So now you have like 285 guys who are there to start our Buds Class 236. As we go through, you get to Hell Week. And by the time you get to Hell Week, that 280 people is now down to like 180. Right. Then through Hell Week, you're now down to like 85 people. You cut the class in half again. You go into dive phase and that 80 people is now cut in half down to about 40 people. You finish dive phase, go into third phase, you know, land warfare and explosives. And by the time you finish, the original guys in the class, we're down to about 23 dudes, right? Who originally started with the class, right? So all this is done is identified, right? right? So all the traits that I brought to the table along with the other guys, the discipline, the mindset, the teamwork, right? The positive mental attitude, like all this stuff, the mental toughness, I had all that and I could have applied it to whatever, you know what I mean? And I was applying it to this specific job. So now this is where the miner holds up that piece of gold that he found in the river, but it doesn't look like the gold in your necklace. It doesn't look like a wedding ring. You know what I mean? It's not polished and shaped. It looks right. like a little nugget of like most people, if they found a piece of gold in the river, they would have no idea that looking at a piece of gold. Right. But it's malleable. You can you can mold it, make it how you want it, shine it, polish it, right? So it was gold before the polishing process. All the elements of the gold are still in this. We just need to form it. So now in the process of learning the skills and the trade of being a SEAL right? The process of uh, fine tuning all the skills and capabilities of, you know, 
uh, shooting and tactics and communications and all this kind of stuff that you have to have to learn. There's so much to learn. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I was there for six years and, and most of the guys in the SEAL teams, you know, who are career guys would be like, dude, you did six years. You were just getting started. You know what I mean? Like you didn't, yeah. you, you need to do like 12 years before you have an idea of what you're doing. Though, from what I understand, I was at your house the other day. We did a, a podcast for your show. And you've got a ton of medals or buttons. I don't know what you guys call them, but like awards, it seems. You uh, you were a pretty special Navy SEAL. Is that correct? I mean, I think I mentioned you telling me about how you passed some tests with flying colors and you were beating guys in competitions. It seemed like you were built and made for this. I mean, I was – I in comparison, right, like I was good. If, if, if doing that was a sport, mm-hmm. like I was – pretty good at it. Yeah. You know what I mean? When it came to multiple schools that I went to, got honor man, you know, um, in shooting competitions against, you know, my peers in, in, uh, they have this competition called metal mania. And every two years you go do this competition with the guys that you, in your, uh, task force or your troop, um, depending on what years you were in. Uh, so you're competing against like 30 to 40 other seals. And the first time I did it when I was a new guy, I got second place the next time around when I did it, I got first place. So it's like, as far as the shooting goes, it was, you know, uh, it was a decent shot, yeah. you know, went through sniper school and all that stuff. Um, but as far as the, the history of the seal teams, I did some really cool missions and we got to do some cool stuff. Um, as far as the history of the seal teams go, I don't think I'll be remembered for, my, the missions that I did right. in relation to some of the other missions that, that have been conducted. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't want to say it as if like, I'm this super seal in comparison to everyone else. Yeah. I was just saying s- simply in the context of, in the ability to do the job, I was good at the job. And it probably exposed something to yourself about yourself as well. Yeah. Right? I mean, you probably discovered things about yourself that you probably otherwise would have not discovered had you not had the pressure and the and, and even the competition to be. To, oh, yeah. Jack Donovan says that a man knows himself through other men by comparison. And so we live in a world that doesn't want to compare and everybody gets a trophy and hierarchy and order is kind of disdained. But for you to n- even know yourself as a man and, and to rise in the ranks that particular way, I would imagine built and can build a, a solid sense of esteem and yeah. self-worth and pride perhaps, or ego. Yeah, for sure. The, so people will be like, oh, Rich, Hell Week, that must've been horrible. You know what I mean? Hell Week is this five and a half to six days. It's our, it's our, it's the crucible for the SEAL teams. You know what I mean? Like in the training to become a SEAL, there's this one block where it's five and a half days of just nonstop physical challenges and mental challenges and you just go, go, go for five and a half days, sleep deprived, hallucinating and all this. And this is kind of like what what we're known for as far as there's so much more to it than Hell Week. Yeah. But that's what everyone sees as Hell Week because it's kind of one of those shock value things like, dude, there's no way the average person, normal person could do that. You know, most people would quit during that. Right. But that is one of those things where I feel not to go on too much of a tangent from the original point of this discussion, but there's a lot of men who lack the opportunity to have that challenge right. that lets them know, like, I was a boy and now I'm a man amongst the peers. When right. you say, like, you know, men amongst your peers. Right. And that's one of those things where it's like when you make it through Hell Week, it's like, okay, you belong here. You're a man. Yeah. You've proven yourself. Your worth. You still don't know crap. Mm-hmm. So be a sponge, shut your mouth, listen and learn, but welcome to the table. Amazing. You know what I mean? Like that's kind of the attitude, but it's so important because coming out of that, it's like, dude, I made it through hell week. I can do anything. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like if I could do that, you know, I could figure out bills. I could figure out, you know, uh, daily struggles or, or challenges or finding a job or whatever it is like. I'll make it work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if I could do that, I could do anything kind of, kind of attitude. So, um, to me, it, it, the, you know, and this would be the p- part of the pot, like it's a, the identifying stage at the same time, 
it's part of polishing the gold stage. Like, you know what I mean? When they start training you to do the job and all that stuff, they're polishing that, that piece of gold. You know what I mean? But you brought all the traits to the table. Right. You're the you know raw I mean? material. You're the raw material. Mm -hmm. Cool. I lose that job. I still have all the raw material. That's mine. Right. And something like that where you get to challenge yourself and prove to yourself more so than anyone else. Get right. to prove to yourself that, you know, I'm worth it. I belong here. I'm capable. I have what it takes. Then with that, you can go and apply it to whatever you want and, you know, take that, the, that same attitude that you applied once before and apply it to something else. Yes, you're going to have to fine tune certain things because maybe your new job isn't the exact same thing. Right. But you can still apply it and, and you know, find success. Right. And I heard you say this earlier and I think it rings true that most men never get an opportunity to be tested that way. And I found it for my life, football and strength training was that. And then being as a coach, being able to see how young men in particular, when they take to the barbell yeah. and put themselves under the weight, the resistance of these challenges, which are more chosen, I guess you choose to be in this team too, but um, they, they, we would choose to subject ourselves to yeah. those challenges in order to have a sense of growth. Um, it's like a rites of passage. It's like an initiation. Exactly. It's like the end of an old version of yourself, weaker, smaller, less capable, less full of esteem uh, into a, a, a man, Yeah. if you will. Talk to what you think is lacking in terms of opportunities for men to be initiated in this way for our growth and stature as, as, as men in this world. I think one of the main things is the timeline is first and foremost, like there's, there's a lot of different reasons and there's, there's a lot of ways to answer that. One of the things that I think is most um, significant though, is the timeline. So most of these times, the rites of passage, if you go to any like tribal culture, the rites of passage is when they're a teenager. Mm -hmm. And it used to be when you graduated high school Right. It used to be if you wore a varsity letter on your jacket, it meant something. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't. Right. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you're you're penalized for being a winner. Right. So everyone gets a trophy. That that stole. Like you thought you were helping. You're you're hurting these young men. Right. Then you graduated high school. That used to mean something. Now it's like, well, if you graduate high school, you got to go to college. Without a college degree, you know what I mean? Right. Now everyone goes to college. So at this point, you go to college. And now if you, oh yeah, everyone goes to college. Well, you don't have a master's, you know what I mean? So now what happens is you've gone to high school, you've gone to college and what has college given you, but debt. So now you're in a position where you've created so much debt and the idea is you still haven't become a man yet. You need to go back and get a master's degree. At this point, you're in your mid twenties, late twenties, and you have so much debt that you can't actually, right. you know, sustain yourself, you're trying to find a job or whatever, even if you get a job, you're in so much debt that if you were to find uh, a woman to have a family with or whatever, you know what I mean? Like she's probably got the same amount of debt as you do. Cause she's probably following the same track record. Right. You know what I mean? She's on the same course. And now here you are, you're trying to be a man, be a leader and all this stuff, but you're already starting off now, almost 30 years old. And you don't feel like you've had your crucible. You don't feel like you've had that defining moment in your life where you've gotten to prove to anyone that you're, you know, belong. Right. And spending eight years around university professors is probably not going to man you who, up too much. Who, if anything, they've been telling you that it's wrong to be a man. Right. You know what I mean? And um, and now how are you supposed to start, lead, and feel confident when you know you have hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt? You feel duped because you didn't understand yeah. how um, how interest works. You know what I mean? Right. And now you're like, how do I pay this back? And then the yeah. kicker is a lot of people don't even wind up getting a job in the field that they were studying in. So now you're back to where you could have been doing right. 10 years earlier, eight years earlier, six years earlier, you know, with just a high school degree, but you would have been that far ahead of the game mm -hmm. without, without the debt. I see in my mind castration and chains. Yeah. And it's essentially what it is. It takes whatever vigor you would have at that time in your life beats it out of you and then puts a ball and chain on you. Yeah. As opposed to, well, what you chose to do, is that correct? Yeah. You went right out of high school into the SEALs or into the Navy. Yeah, I went I went in at 
18, 18. Given the state of the world, what are your thoughts on what a young man should do in that stage of his life? Is it still a good idea to go into the service or is there another option? I don't think it's necessarily the military is is the answer. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You got to find out what it is for you. Before I went right. to the before I went into the military, I was one of my biggest passions was Thai boxing. You know what I mean? And the, I started Thai boxing when I was fourteen or fifteen years old. It was whatever, whatever, however old I was in eighth grade, and I was small. I was like one hundred and thirty five, one hundred and forty pounds. And my brother, Gene, was like, dude, you're going to get your ass kicked in high school. You're too small. You know, and I was trying to lift <laughs> weights. I just wasn't getting any bigger. You know what I mean? I still haven't got that much bigger, you know, after all the things that I've done. But um, but he was worried that I was going to get beat up in high school. So he brings me to this underground fight club before fight before people knew what fight club <laughs> right. was. You know what I mean? And I'm thinking, I, I don't know what I'm going to this this cage match in this dude's basement you know, it turns out to be the Thai boxing, but it was before MMA got really big and people didn't know what Thai boxing was. So I fell in love with Thai boxing in this dude's basement. But the thing was, is the guys who were in this in this class, one guy was like a corrections officer. One dude was a former bodybuilder. You had a couple guys who were cops. And here I am like, a, like 14, 15 years old, 135 pounds. And I'm training with dudes who are like 200, 260 yeah. pounds, like like full grown men working in, you know, law enforcement style jobs and stuff like that. Um, And, and other guys who are just big Thai boxers become like mentors and elders of sorts to you somewhat, but Mm. it was, but there was something to be said for just standing in there, you know, toe to toe at 140 pounds, we'll call it to a dude who's 220 Mm -hmm. and I'm holding pads from every time he kicks and they're not going easy on me. You know what I mean? Like, Hey dude, we're not going to slow our training down because you're in here. Right. You know what I mean? Like if you want to, we came here to train. If you want to come train with us, that's fine, Mm -hmm. but we're not slowing down for you. You're going to get punched in the face. You know what I mean? So I'm sitting there holding the pads and they're kicking it. I'm like flying into the wall. I would stand next to the wall. Yeah. You know, they had like this one, um, this one like concrete wall and they had like some pads on this other wall and I'd stand by it in the beginning and I'd, I'd hold the pads and they'd hit it and I like kind of bounce into the wall and then come back into position so I wouldn't fall over. Yeah. But it was just like, um, at that point, you know, standing in front of someone who is so much bigger than me and striking and then getting the affirmation from them like dude you're starting to hit hard this sounds like a really like under you said underground sort of like a before mma got big before like they commercialized a lot of uh martial arts and stuff like that yeah was this like a like i can imagine in my mind that this is sort of like a place where there's a lot of grit and there's a lot of growing up for a young man that would spend some time there as opposed to I don't, I don't want to knock the commercialization of martial arts because I think it's good in some way to yeah. spread it but these places where like everybody gets a a belt you know after uh, just being there for a few months yeah I know it was awesome I mean you'd be sitting there holding the pads and it's like guys would hit the pads and like even though you're holding the tie pads it was like someone was hitting it with a with a like a metal pipe and you come back and I just had like welts and lumps all the way down my forearms and my shins were just totally bruised. And, um, you know, it was like the old school mentality of like shin conditioning. Old school, yeah. We're just like doing shin conditioning and stuff. So like, I just, dude, I loved it. I ate it up. I just be in, yeah. in like, I got to the point where I was just in high school and I'd be sitting at the desk and I was just going dink, dink, dink. And like just slapping my shins against right. the, the legs of the, the desk and it's like the people sitting next to me were getting like nauseous. Like, dude, you're you're grossing me out. Would you please stop hitting your shin bone against the the metal pipe? Yeah. And it's like ding ding. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, just starting to see your body like harden up, and it's right. just like, dude, I'm turning my body into a, a freaking wrecking ball. That's right. You know so what I mean? The gym, man. The yeah. gym. The gym. I mean, for me, it was barbells and it was stones and tires. I never really got into fighting or anything like that. But it seems like it has to be something physical. There's no growing into a man through mental activity. Yeah. At least I don't see it that way. Men have to do something. It's got to be something physical. It's got to be something challenging. It's got to uh, engage some austerity, right? Some some discipline. In other words, denying yourself, right? Denying certain foods or denying yourself even comfort and pleasure of not getting off the couch and getting out there and getting beat up with a pipe like you did. Yeah. I mean, and 
So then you, you start doing the mental challenge of like the workouts are hard. You keep going, you know, you got coaches. This is you, people see this in wrestling. Like mm -hmm. the coach has got you doing wind sprints in the freaking stairwells and they shut the doors. So it gets all humid yeah. and they're making it like, we're not stopping till these walls are dripping. You know what I mean? And you know, you see the guys from <laughs> wrestling doing that yeah. where they're wearing the sweatsuits and all that kind of stuff. And so whatever it is for you, but finding something that that challenges you, but that's a lot easier to do when you're younger. Right. You know what I mean? Like people are like, Rich, do you think you can make it through buds right now at 41? And you're like, <laughs> I'm I'd not like, sure I'd want to. I'd like to think mentally I could. <laughs> I don't know if if my ligaments and other things would would hold out. You right. know what I mean? But at the same time too, you have uh other responsibilities and other things like you're in a different phase of your life. Mm -hmm. So to try to be Proving to yourself that you're a man in your 30s or 40s, not that you can't do it. Sure. Right. But that's the wrong phase. Right. You know what I mean? Everything has a, every, you know, progression. Like if you're going to talk about martial arts, it's like when you're a young buck in martial arts, it's like what you lack in understanding, you can make up with energy, endurance, sheer will. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Then in the middle, you start to learn technique, you get strength and, and you have technique, you have a little bit of experience, so you can kind of um, slow down a little bit and not yeah. like blow your fuel tank, you know what I mean? Just trying to go like overkill because you got to pace yourself, Right. you know what I mean? You get later on into it and it's like, I've seen so much and experienced so much, I can read, I can read the fight and what's going to happen, I can make predictions. And now I can use your energy against you, right. you know, with different counters and timing and, and tactics, right? Strategy. So I don't have to work as hard, but, at, but at that point in time, you're not trying to just overpower everyone with, with sheer will because yeah, you don't wisdom. need to, because you have wisdom. Then you get yeah. into the later phase where it's like, Hey dude, I'm too old for this crap. I'm not rolling around with the 18 year olds. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm here to guide you and coach you and mentor right. you. And it's not that you couldn't beat up the guy. If this dude knew what he knew now at 18, he would, you know, totally beat the other 18 year old. Right. Right. But that's not his phase. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's harder to kind of jump into the, let me prove that I'm a man in my forties or fifties or thirties. Right. It's when, the wrong stage. When that's the wrong stage. I needed to be doing that when I had the energy and the fire and the grit and I needed to right. do it. Right. And get through that phase, you know, show that I belong at the table, but show up. The other thing is just the environment. So you get to the team and it's like you show up there, you got now how it works is you go through SEAL training, which is BUDS, basic underwater demolition school. And then after that, you go to jump school and then you go to SEAL qualification training, SQT. At the, and that's where you learn how to be a SEAL. So at the end of SQT, you know, so your, your, your tryouts for this are like a year, right? And at the end of that, you get your Trident, your C Navy SEAL insignia, and then you show up to your SEAL team. And you think that like, hey, dude, look, I'm a SEAL. I've made it. And you show up and it's like, dude, you don't you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And it's right. like, hey, introduce yourself. And you'd walk up and you'd be like, hi, my name's, you know, whatever. And they're like, hey, tell us about yourself, what your interests are, where you're from. And you got the whole team there and you walk up and you're like, oh, okay. Hey, guys, you know, so this is who I am. And you go to introduce yourself and then everyone just yells, shut up. And it's like, shut up. And you're like. Oh, they were joking. And you go to say again and everyone just tells you to shut up. And it's like, then they tell you, hey, dude, yeah. no, no one cares. Get in the back. Right. Humility. Yeah. So you're like, okay, I got to try it in, but I haven't earned it yet. Right. You know what I mean? Like I can wear it on my uniform, but amongst my peers, mm -hmm. I haven't earned it. I'm allowed to be here at the team and I'm allowed to wear it. Right. But I'm still a new guy. I'm still in the learning phase. It's like, welcome to the team, right. shut your mouth and learn. So now there's this humility. So it's like you go through this challenge, you go through your crucible, just like the young kid in the tribe has to climb the mountain and get the rock from the top of the mountain and bring it back down to the elders. If he wants to sit in the fire circle, you know what I mean, at night with all the leaders who are talking about what they're going to do as far as a tribe. Right. And it's like you bring the rock down. And when you sit around the fire ring, no one's asking you for your opinion right. on, and your guidance. It's so funny because everybody's opinion counts today. Yeah. And it's like, cool, you earn the right to sit at the circle. Right. No one wants to hear what you have to say. If we Amazing. want your opinion, we'll ask for it. <laughs> you don't that. know shit yet. Right. You There's know what no I mean? humility. Like, dude, you're a kid. You have no experience. What Robert Bly describes that as is writing, being 
taught how to ride the red horse. So you got the white horse, the red horse, and the black horse. And you described all three phases completely. The white horse's innocence is boyishness. It's being a, a good boy, doing the right thing. A lot of mommy energy is associated with it. One of the problems with our world is, is, is that they want to keep men in the white horse stage. That's why it's pushed all the way out till 30 or 40 when they have a, this sense that I haven't tapped into my aggression. Mm -hmm. The aggression is where the red horse is being taught how to how you're being taught how to ride the red horse, meaning, okay, you have all this power, you have all this strength, you have all this skill, you have all this aggression, you have this ability, but you don't know shit. Yeah. So you've got to take you, the the real training for a boy that's that's learning to ride that red horse is how to use most effectively and with most reverence and responsibility testosterone, that power, that strength, that ability that you have. Otherwise, it manifests itself in perverted ways like yeah. gangs or you know, the, just the, the hubris of most uh, young men today because there's no older men that have ridden the black horse that can show them or say to them, shut up. Yeah. I don't care how tough you think you are. I don't care how big you are. I don't care if you're stronger than me right now. The bottom line is you're still a boy. You're still inept. You still don't know how to use that incredible weapon that we've been honing in you. So you need to now listen. The black horse is associated with humor. That's what he says. He says the black horse is when wisdom sets in because you don't take yourself so seriously anymore. The, the mark of it is you can laugh at yourself. Mm -hmm. You can look at yourself and say, I'm not that important. Yeah, I'm pretty damn good. I've done a lot of good things. I got a lot of power, but I know my place. And as the black horse men that you put yourself around in that instance did for you and to you was to show you, hey, Okay, it's cool. Yeah, you're strong. You're, you're whatever it is. I think you already know that. You don't need a reminder. Here's how to hone that in with humility and use it responsibly. Exactly. Exactly. So I think something of that is so important for young men, but it doesn't have to be the military. It's just, it's a very obvious example. You know what I mean? And it could be through sports. Mm -hmm. And this is why I talked to this. Uh, the, I use this analogy of of the the mining for gold, because how many college athletes do you know who didn't go pro, right? Or got an injury, right? Or you know they've been working for this job and then they just laid off. You know they get laid off from this job, and now they go into identity crisis. I mean maybe you wanted to play football, and your entire childhood was re revolved around football, right? The schools that you chose. The colleges at your universities that you chose revolved around the football teams. You know what I mean? Like they're all your plans and everything revol revolved around football. And you're used to, here's another big kicker. You're used to being in front of the stadium. You played college ball. You have an entire stadium of people cheering for you. Right. You're in the spotlight. You're important. You're semi-famous, right? Or as you feel it. And then all of a sudden you get cut out of that and you get pulled out of that circle. And now no one cares you work at a car lot and you're like oh yeah i used to play college ball and they're like oh that's cool you know what i mean like yeah nobody cares nobody cares and that's what a lot of veterans are facing because it's like oh proud to be an american like i have my uniform you know america respects me uh, uh, right like, i fought for my country and then what happens is you you lose the uniform and you lose that identity and it's like no one cares. And you lose the communitas. You, Those that yeah. understand what that even means. You're, you're not in the in uniform anymore. It's like, you know, the SEAL teams, like, I would call it a fast moving train. And it's as soon as you step off, that train keeps going. Like people are like, hey, dude, you still keep in contact with all your SEAL buddies? I keep in contact with the dudes now that they're out because we're older, right? right? But when I got pulled out of the teams, that train kept going like I was never even there. Yeah. It was like I was a blip on the radar and it's like gone, forgotten. Thanks for coming. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And not that they should have slowed down for me. You know what I mean? But it was a super humbling experience that it's when you think you're actually important, like maybe you're not as important as you think you are. Right. You know what I mean? That's the black um, horse. Not saying that on a personal level for your family, for whatever, that you're not important. We're all mm -hmm. important. But I'm just saying as far as your ego goes... You know what I mean? That that train's rolling yeah. and the war's still going and the guys still got a train. Mm -hmm. And I got a taste of the six years of me missing holidays and weddings and, you know, not 
take making phone calls and people not being able to get in touch with me or talk to me for six months or seven months or whatever, you know, it's like, dude, you're always gone. Like you don't realize it because you're in it. And then it's just like, well, there's, it's just me here. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And coming back, you know, full circle to what we were first talking about is coming out and going on that basically, you know, searching for what do I do now? Right. You know what I mean? The the interesting thing of it is I came to peace with this is not my story anymore. Right. If if my story was in books, that 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 was a couple chapters. Sure. And those chapters are done. Mm -hmm. And now I'm moving on to the next chapter. What's this what's the story of this chapter? And as I gave that up for that, you know, uh everything up for that seven years while I was going on my own spiritual quest. The funny thing is it all came back right, and it was handed back to me. And now what I've been doing, um, I never, I never sought out to be a full time fire instructor and to be traveling around the world, you know, working with all these different groups and all this stuff. Um, and having a property with my own ranch and training facility and all mm -hmm. that stuff. It's just, it came back to me and it was, Hey, Rich, can you come work with our SWAT team? Okay. And then it was, hey, can you come here and work with our SWAT team? Hey, can you come here and work with this family? Hey, can you go do security for this? Hey, the Olympics are coming. Can you give us some guys and do, you know, security for this you know, athlete and his family that are going to Brazil? You know, blah, 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 blah. And it was one of those things to where I was dabbling in it for fun, you know, because I enjoyed doing it, but I wasn't pursuing it. And then it basically landed back and it was like, this is, this is silly. Like there's so much opportunity here right. and there's such demand for it. Why don't I just treat this like an actual business yeah. and apply all the business stuff that I've been learning and studying to this and see what I can do with it. Mm -hmm. And then that's, that's where that, you know, grew from there. Well, it's what God was preparing you for. Yeah. You know, we have our own plans, but it's like God's, he's also doing the sifting process with you yeah. in the, in the, you know, the, the fullness of your life rather than just, you know, for, for a season. And so obviously that was a training for something that you're providing for lots of people that really need it in a bad way, especially today. And your story and mine, they're different, but very similar in a way where yours was with the military. I never went to the military, but I played college football. I did the strongman training thing. Uh, and as a strength coach, it was my desire to bring that challenge, austerity, the initiation, and the community aspect of being on a team mm -hmm. and being challenged as a team, having a coach, a leader, an elder, and that existential experience that only that can draw something really powerful out of a man. I did it with Strength Camp, and I see you doing it with your training, yeah. but more specifically with the Protector Summit. When I saw what you were doing at the Protect Protector Summit in terms of like offering it to the world, offering it to men, offering it to anybody who wants to have that initiatory experience, to, to get their hands dirty, to do something challenging, to challenge not only their minds and their spirits, but their bodies in this very profound and uh, masculine way, I was like, man, I would love to team up and, and do stuff with this guy because we're on the same journey. Yeah, for sure. And that's, and that's really where it comes into... Well, why do we even do the Protector Summit? Right. And it's like, okay, cool. What I mainly get, what people mainly know me for is firearms instruction. You know what I mean? And it's like, they're, shooting well is only one thing. You know what I mean? And if you want to know what I'm, what I'm truly about, right? Like I can teach you to shoot and I can teach you to move and do th different things like that. But in the bigger picture, am I training people to, who am I training and what do I want them to do with the knowledge that I'm giving them? Right. Who do I want them to be as individuals with the knowledge that I'm passing on? Because I'm building someone up with a certain skill and capability. How do I make sure that the skill and capability is being used? There's a responsibility there. You know what I mean? So how do I know that, that the things that I'm training them are going to be utilized in the correct manner, right? Um, and now we look at going back into the, the conferences that we were talking about. And it's like, here's a great opportunity to let's bring everyone in. And let's expose them to the to the bigger picture, the full spectrum warrior philosophy. So they're not training a bunch of like meatheads or deviants 
that were people who are hyper aggressive with all this knowledge, but they don't know how to make simple decisions. They don't know how to be emotionally stable. They don't know how to be leaders or to communicate because these are all certain things that maybe de-escalate a situation. Right. You know what I mean? Or maybe these are things that help uh, avoid, or maybe this is this helps them step up when the time comes where they need right. to step up. Access that and aggression. Not, and not be the one who runs away from the school shooting, mm -hmm. be the one who steps in and stops it. But at the same time, not being the one who escalates some road rage and goes and creates a, an incident where someone gets killed because they're emotionally unstable, right? Versus being mature about the decisions and how they handle a stressful situation or, you know, when they're having a bad day. Right. So in that, that's where we start tying in the other aspects of this to where we go, Hey dude, you can come out to this event that we're going to do. And we're going to talk to you about the faith and the spirituality side of this. And we're going to talk to you about uh, teamwork and communication. We're going to talk to you about, you know, all these different important areas that you might get another business conference but the difference is when we talk to you about teamwork, we're going to test your ability to do teamwork. And maybe that's through carrying a log. So that was the first thing that the guys did last time. That was quite a surprise. So that was their punch in the face. We weren't physically punching them in the face, but mm -hmm. everyone showed up. And what they didn't realize was the first thing that was going to happen is they were all going to get teamed up, you know, and have to carry this big log like in SEAL training and walk through a lake, get soaking wet, get <laughs> sandy you yeah. know, welcome to the protector summit. You know what I mean? And just basically give everyone a humble experience, right? you know? And one of the things that I, that I tell them in this is they think it's a punishment and it's like, dude, this isn't a punishment. This is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to see what you're made of. This is an opportunity to see how can you handle your composure? How do you communicate with the other guys with you yeah. on the log? Are you guys arguing with each other? Are you guys strategy, you know, strategizing and coming up and encouraging each other and figure out how we're, we're in this together. We got to carry this log for two miles up and down sand hills through puddles and lakes yep. and all this kind of stuff. Are you guys going to go and turn in on each other and destroy each other? Are you guys going to prevail, you know, a, and work well together? So this is an opportunity to learn about yourself. How do you handle yourself under stress and pressure? How do you, and different types of pressure? you know, physical pressure, you know, time constraints, not knowing where the, where the end is because no one knew how far we were going to go. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So we have, you know, these different stress factors and how do you handle yourself through that? So we had the punch in the face when yep. you first got there and then we broke up into different groups. And so tell us about the different stations that we had. You have a whole bunch of different experts that come in, medical experts, firearms training, combat. I did strongman training. Uh, why did you choose these various coaches and what's important about each one of their uh, skill sets that they're teaching the men while they're there for the two days? Yeah. So Elliot, you were running the, the strength portion, which Strong is really man. cool. You, you know, he's doing his Atlas stones and getting the guys, you know, to get, you know, some, at this point, everyone's already got dirty. Yeah. But again, there's something to be said for going outside, getting in the sand and the dirt. There's no air conditioning. There's no fans. It's tough. You know, it's, it's tough. We're in it's, Florida. It's, it's not, you know, what's that? What's the one with the with the warning, the the meathead warning thing? Was that like Planet Fitness or something? Or Lunk Alert. Lunk Alert. Yeah. You that's know what right. I mean? Like we got a Lunk Alert, but it's in the good well, way. Let me expand you know I mean? on the stones there for a moment. Because yeah. when you told me about this, I am not former military. I don't have any combat skills. I did a little bit of uh what is it? Muay Thai. Mm -hmm. um, but I instantly, it rang true in my mind that if this is what I believe it is, and it is, the rites of passage initiation aspect of it is critical, even the carrying of the logs. But I've discovered through my own experience, but then through the hundreds of men I've coached and have come down to Florida to do one simple thing that just changes their psyche instantly, and that is pick up a heavy rock. It sounds crazy, because it seems so simple, but there's something primal that's associated with being able to pick up an earthen stone yeah. and put it on your lap or to let, uh, put it on top of something. So much so that, in fact, anthropologists and people who study uh, traditional societies have discovered that, na namely, in the, uh, the European islands, you know, uh, Irish and Scottish and uh, the, in the Basque region, they would use... They, what they would call man stones. There's a whole documentary on uh, in, on um, 
Netflix, I think it's called uh, Stones of Strength. Mm Mm-hmm. There's a book about it as well, that you don't get to be called a man. You don't get to work with the men in the, on the ships. You don't get to show your face <laughs> around here until you pick this stone up, buddy. And once you pick that stone up, it's like, oh, okay, good. Not bad. Here's the next one. Yeah. And here's the next one. So the first time I came out, I brought everything from, I think my smallest stone was like a... 150 pound stone up to my 300 pound stone and we have guys just test themselves and i gave them all names there's boy and then there's man and then there's warrior and then there's king and uh and the guys would come out and my station was about introducing them into a ancient rites of passage and have the experience of picking up a big piece of concrete and doing something manly with it and uh and I was very honored to be able to to bring that experience. And I know a lot of the guys, um, they, there's like a breakthrough that happens. Yeah. So much so that a lot of guys went out, including yourself, and brought their own stones. Yeah, I got a so whole set of them. That's right. So you've got your own stones. I don't have to bring mine anymore. And uh, and the guys are coming back. That's another cool thing about the Protector Summit. They come back because they want to test themselves again. Hey, how did I do with the stones last time? Can I pick up another one? Or how what, you talked to me about a guy who was came in out of shape. Yep. And he experienced how bad out of shape he was, and he's been committed. I think you said he lost several He's pounds. lost a ton of weight. He's been going to the gym every day. He's changed his diet. And by him, here's one something I didn't tell you. By him doing this, because he's like, dude, I'm not going to come back and be an embarrassment. Like, when I'm on that log, I'm not going to be a detriment to my team. Right. And I'm going to pick up that damn stone. And he picked up a pretty big stone, but he's a big dude. Right. Right. But in relation, like, he felt he should be lifting a bigger stone. You know what I mean? And in the change, he said, I'm coming back next year and I'm going to, you know, carry that log and be an asset to my team. So I need more endurance and I'm going to be stronger and more fit. And I'm going to pick up a bigger stone next year. And one of the awesome things, let alone like him changing, you know, his diet, him training multiple times a week um, and all that is it's had it's rubbed off on his family. So now his wife has joined in <sighs> Amazing. and they're having the diet together. Right. You know what I mean? And they're going to the gym together. And not to say it couldn't happen the other way around, but I have to draw attention to the fact that as a head of his family, yeah. as a father, your family is going to follow your lead, whether consciously or unconsciously. What's the example you're setting? Right. If yeah. you're going to be fit, well, your wife is going to want to be fit too. If you're going to be fat, she's going to allow herself to be fat. Yeah. And so we see some breakthroughs there. So that's been a a huge thing. We had other coaches that we brought in. Like one coach is Kit Cope. He is a four-time world champion Muay Thai boxer, (laughs) lived in Thailand for years, you know, and he went into the UFC for a while, had fights in there. And, uh, you know, we have him coming and he's done, Kit's got a crazy story. He's done like everything. He's just like one of those people, like it's like the Forrest Gump you know, a uh, story where it's like Forrest Gump's done like all these things and they're all totally different from each other. Yeah. And he's, you know, and, um, you know, Kit's got one of those from doing security to being like a, a, a forest firefighter doing the smoke jumping stuff where all they cool skydive stuff. in to, to fires, all sorts of wild stuff. Uh, he's currently working with like the Diaz brothers as their, as their stand up coach. And uh, oh, wow. as like their, he helps a lot of these UFC fighters with their, you know, meal plans and and all that stuff. Because again, if you're fighting professionally on that level, cutting weight and making your weight class without losing all your energy and all that stuff is a huge part of it. You know what I mean? So he's doing a lot of that. So we bring Kit out and he helps with our stand-ups, you know. So before you go on, let me use that as a plug. So if you want to be training with guys like Rich, guys like Kit, and guys like me for a full weekend, Go to protectwithelliot.com. That'll bring you to the Full Spectrum Warrior website, which is Rich's website. But just so you can remember, that'd be easy. Protectwithelliot.com. And sign up. It's happening in February, the first weekend in February, second and third. And if you use the promo code HULSE10, H-U-L-S-E 10, you'll get 10% off. Yep. As well as some special bonuses from me. So if you do do that, make sure, well, you use 10, he'll let me, host 10, he'll yep. let me know. And I'm going to reach out to you personally. And, uh, and I've got some bonuses for guys that sign up for that. So Protector Summit, you can get there by protectwithelliot.com. And Rich, so tell us who else is there and what else are people going to learn and what kind of other experiences are available when guys show up? Yeah. So just like that, we're going to have some other Navy SEALs there. 
uh, teaching different things from medical, firearms training, you know, so a lot of people have a gun. Do you know how to use it? You know, we have some really cool. Uh, now, if guys don't have a gun and they've never shot before, to be completely honest, the first time I met you, I've never used a rifle. And so I've gotten all my training from you. But if a guy shows up and he doesn't have any, he'd never used it before, uh, what's the process like for him? Can he, he can borrow just let one us or know. rent let it? Let us know. Yeah, you can rent a gun. I have a bunch of them. Okay, cool. Because I know that might be a hang up for some guys or yeah. even traveling with firearms. So if you're traveling with am- and you need ammo or you're traveling and need a firearm, like if you let us know, the way we do it is we break up. So like, let's say there's 60, 80 people or whatever. We're not, you're not going to be on the line, like on the shooting line or in the gym, you know, or at the stones with 80 dudes. There are certain events that we do where it's everyone's there, all attendance. And those are a lot of like the team drills and, and the team kind of things for the camaraderie of having the group together. But when we go and we do our breakout sessions where you're getting to work with the coaches, we're going to break you up into like groups of anywhere from 10 to 20 people. And then that way you have a way more intimate experience with each coach, whether you're doing the medical training, you're doing the shooting. Um, we're going to have, uh, you know, team building drills and oh, that's right. Obstacle yeah, course, the obstacle course, awesome. which is pretty gnarly. <laughs> and, uh, one of our sponsors this year is going to be Mira gas masks. So they saw us <laughs> with doing some of the stuff with the gas masks last year. They're coming in. So hopefully they're going to provide a whole bunch of gas masks. So you're going to get to do an experience of that. Maybe running the old course with a gas mask, maybe shooting with the gas mask. Uh, we're going to integrate some vehicle stuff. Um, you know, we're going to integrate some family protection drills, you know, kind of like executive protection drills, but how that translates to your family. Right. So maybe if you have kids or your wife or whatever, um, or maybe it's just a friend, but it's good, you know, putting some different tactics and, and stuff like that into into the shooting and training and the coaching. So that way it's not just... Um, it's not just shooting at paper targets. Right. It's real life stuff. Yeah. You're outdoors. You're, you're getting busy. My dad, you invited my dad and I to come to your training. It was one of your advanced trainings last week or the week before. And you had us like running and, and doing puzzles, climbing over things. And then in that state of exhaustion, being able to collect ourselves and aim and shoot. Yeah. I mean, so it's a lot more than just like being at the, the range. Yeah. And again, coming back into the to the full spectrum where philosophy of this is if all it took was shooting good, right, to be a Navy SEAL, then they just do a shooting test. Right. You know what I mean? Like that's that's it. You know what I mean? So a lot of people come because they want to shoot like a Navy SEAL and then it's like, okay, well, you know, from a self-defense standpoint, let's look at this. You want to come because you want to shoot like a Navy SEAL and carry a pistol every day. Okay, great. Well, you're going to, we can teach you how to shoot, but if you're carrying concealed and the guy walks up to you and he's a few feet away and you don't have the time and distance to draw your gun to defend yourself from maybe he has a knife or something like that. Can you fight from this distance? Do you know how to fight? Cool. You got a gun. You're going to get stabbed to death. That's okay, right. so let's take that back Full one spectrum. step. Let's learn how to fight. Okay, cool. Well, if you want to be a good fighter, you should probably be strong, right? Well, one, you got to know how to fight to be at a level where you're fighting good and with power, you probably need to be strong, mm-hmm. right? Well, okay, so if you want to be strong, you probably want to supplement that with a solid diet, you know, and whatnot. So all this stuff starts laying on each other. And when we start looking at all this, then coming – whipping this circle back around and going, okay, well, who am I training? You know what I mean? Where are you emotionally? Where are you mentally? For you to accomplish what we're talking about, you need to be able to set goals. Right. First, you need to have a vision. Right. And now you need a game plan to execute that vision. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Well, now you got a vision and you want to execute it. You need the discipline to actually do it. And I would have to add also that there's got to be a level of devotion to something for this to be real. Exactly. When studying the archetypes through Robert Moore, King Warrior, Magician, Lover, the warrior that is not devoted to something higher, something existential, God, for example, uh, is considered a mercenary. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, he's a soldier. He's not an actual warrior, meaning he's fighting for pay as opposed to a man who's fighting for something great, something that's bigger, be it God, country, family. So just having that orientation, I think, is so important in terms of why are we doing this? Who am I training? Exactly. And that's and that your to your exact point on that is the one the 
what I call this is the the philosophy, but is like the hashtag that we use is the FSW full spectrum wear lifestyle. And it's because it's not it, you, it's not a plug and play. You can't just do it once and you're done. You don't go to the gym once and now you're jacked. Right. You know what I mean? Like you don't go to one uh, class for Thai boxing and now you can knock everyone out. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like it's a lifestyle. You have it's something you have to live and practice daily. You know what I mean? We had this saying at the SEAL teams where it's you have to polish your trident every day Amazing. or you have to earn your trident every day. That's right. Cool. You, you did what it took yesterday, but what are you going to do today about it? You know, and the the cornerstone to all of this is is our faith, right? Because who are you fighting for? You have all this knowledge. You have this power. You have this influence. You're leading people. Well, who are you leading them to? Right. What is the message that's guiding the the rules or the the aspects that you're trying to instill in others right. and and what effect does that have on their lives what are they doing with that what's the cornerstone to that so that's where it comes back into that spiritual walk that i had or came to the realization is it it has to be in line with with god or otherwise i'm leading people in the wrong direction right and it's one of these things where it's like I, i'm not even trying to necessarily lead people it's I found myself in this position where people were following what I was doing. So now all of a sudden there's this responsibility that I didn't ask for, but it's been, you know, bestowed onto me and I've, I've run with it. You know what I mean? But it's one of those things as we and start you have to ask yourself by which authority. Exactly. Right. Cause in the seals, you have an authority. You always have an authority. There's a chain of command. And in this day that, eschews authority and no one wants to have an authority we basically become our own gods and that allows us to let our lead ourselves and other people astray and so i know that it's so counterintuitive to so many people but allowing christ to be our head and allowing god to be on top orients everything that we do to responsibility with that authority otherwise it's 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 diabolical it's useless it's actually hurtful to be leading people um away from well, think What's of it right? like think of it like this to to you know expand on your point. In the military, you have what they call rules of engagement. Right. Each operation, each theater, each city, each place that you go, there's specific rules of engagement for what you can and cannot do within that area. Sometimes, like I wasn't in Fallujah, but in the big push through Fallujah, they drop leaflets into the city, and it's like if you are still here in two weeks when we come through, and you're a fighting age man, you're dead. End of story. We're not asking questions. Then there's other things to where guys are doing peacekeeping missions in Africa and they're watching the local uh, warlords come through and execute civilians and do this and that. And you're not to get involved, but you're just kind of like, hey, guys, let's not fight. You know what I mean? That's not necessarily what we would do. But yeah. like like from a job standpoint, they wouldn't task us with that necessarily. But I'm just saying like you have UN soldiers who their peacekeep their like their peacekeeping rules of engagement, you almost ask yourself, what's the point of you guys even being there? Right. You know, nothing on them. That's the rules of engagement that they've sure. been given. They're oriented their hands to are some... completely tied. Yeah. You know what I mean? Kind of like you watch what's happening in convenience stores around the country right now where, you know, there's people coming in and doing flash mobs and looting the whole store and stealing everything out of the store. And you got a security guard and the security guard's just watching it all go down and does nothing about it. Right. Why? Because his rules of engagement don't allow him to do it. Well, his, he doesn't have much authority. He hasn't. No. So what happens is when we look at this, we go, okay, if I, if the government told you, if someone steals a candy bar, you can shoot them. Now you got Now you go, okay. Authority well, that's, and responsibility. That's the rules of engagement. <laughs> I've been told it's okay. You know what I mean? So because the government or someone of authority told me I can or cannot use a certain amount of force, right? Mm -hmm. I I can. I step out of that and now I'm in I'm in the position of my own free will. Right. You know what I mean? I don't have a, a government authority necessarily going, hey, here's today's operation and this is our rules of engagement, right? If you take all of the government out. Who's the who's the guiding factor? Who's making the decisions on the rules of engagement? When you come into having the judgment call of how do you react to things in your life, what's your guiding principles? Well, most people live by Satan's mantra, do what thou wilt. Yeah. There is no uh, sense of responsibility towards divine authority. Yeah. And There's like, no God. And when you look at that, 
and that goes into a previous discussion that we had, where it was like, I know a lot of people, they, they go, yeah, you know, I, I study a bunch of religions and, you know, uh, you know, I'll do a little Hindu and a little Buddhist and I got this from Islam and this from Christianity and this from Scientology. And it's like, what well, the problem with that is you're picking and choosing the, sh- the stuff that you like from each. Right. And then what happens is you're picking the stuff you like, not the stuff you need. Right. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times the stuff that we need is the one that is challenges us the most. Absolutely. You know what I mean? As kids, kids don't want discipline, but they need it. Mm-hmm. When we're working with working dogs, they need discipline. They don't want it. You know what I mean? Right. And when we don't have that discipline, it creates turmoil and confusion and stress in our life. So what is that guiding principle that's helping us make these moral decisions on how we guide and lead our lives and those around us? And that's the, coming back to that full circle of within within the, the full spectrum we're philosophy of this lifestyle, right? And that's what we're trying to instill with people at the Protector Summit. That's right. We're trying to give them bits and pieces of, you know, we need to be strong men. We need to be leaders for our family. It's okay to get dirty. It's okay to be physical. But there's still a guiding principle. There's still a moral code that we have to follow. So that separates us from being, you know, a bunch of, you know, uh, killers and and abusers and you know heathens versus being you know strong men of faith who are leaders for our family and the community you know what i mean and that's what we're trying to is give people an opportunity to experience that and to train in that atmosphere and with like-minded men you know and basically get a taste of these different aspects of of areas of our life to grow in it's the exact opposite of toxic masculinity in, yeah. in that it's a matter of maximizing our masculine ex- essence as protectors. And that's why you call it the protector summit, but given towards responsibility, given dignity, given authority, and given uh, that we're not ordering it towards effeminacy and pleasure and do what thou wilt and living the YOLO lifestyle. Yeah, This is about being carnally, physically, skillfully strong and powerful, but to a higher end. And ultimately, and I know that it was covered in your in the first Protector Summit, and I've been studying it deeply recently. I'd love to present on spiritual warfare. Yeah. Because ultimately, that's what it boils down to. If our prayer life is not in order, if we are not spiritually spiritually strong and oriented towards God in everything that we do, then we are no better than the toxic YOLO effeminate uh, pleasure lovers of the world. For sure. We're just having a lot of fun with guns. Yeah. And I mean, that is fun, Mm -hmm. but there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? And, and for me personally, I don't want my legacy to just be the dude who taught people to shoot fast or whatever. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. I want to make an impact. And if I'm going to put my time and energy into something, right. It's okay. You know, God gave me this opportunity and and this and that. And, you know, um, I went for three and a half months with that blood clot and everyone was like, how the hell didn't you have an aneurysm? Cause we were still operating, doing our stuff. You know what I mean? And I have a lot of friends who have passed away, you know, and I didn't, and I got out of the SEAL teams pretty, pretty unscathed. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those things where a lot was taken away. There was reflection time and then it was handed back. And not, we don't have time to go into my whole story of all that, right? But I think that we all have, uh, once we come to that realization of of how God's working in our life, then we need to return that and go, God, how would you have me work in your life? Yeah, in, in, let me be an instrument for you. Exactly. Let me be a warrior for you. So what would you have me do? Right. And for me, it's not just to teach people to shoot fast and shoot accurate without putting context behind it that's mm-hmm. just if that's the if that's the the one avenue that brings people to the door you know what i mean and then you know that's what's the the hook that people are like hey i want to come shoot fast but after getting around these guys there's more to this and if that's what that is then awesome you know what i mean and i think that's where we separate from just running shooting schools you know what I mean? Because if you come to the shooting schools, I'm not, I'm not, you know, walking everyone up and smack them across the head with the Bible. You know what I mean? Like, here, learn this. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? If you want to come shoot, come shoot. 
You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But the protector summit is the opportunity where you can go, hey, if you want to learn more about what truly drives us and, and the bigger picture about what we're passionate about, right? And what the lifestyle truly means, then come join us here at the protector summit and experience it. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. Rich, this has been amazing, bro. I really appreciate you. Yeah, I, appreciate I appreciate your presence in my life, dude. I appreciate the fact that now I live about 20 minutes away from you. Yeah. And, uh, and it's been really cool uh, training with you, bringing my family to train with you, bringing my dad to train with you, and now partnering with you on this venture of yep. the Protector's Summit, which is, uh, I can only see amazing things unfolding for it in the coming years as men are craving more of this initiation process or experience, uh, more of doing what men do with their hands, which is we fight and yeah. we should know how to use firearms, but really oriented to bringing men towards Christ and raising up our spiritual warfare fighting ability yeah. as well. So we can win this war against Satan on this planet, brother. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. So if you haven't yet, which you should have done about 20 minutes ago when I told you to, go to protectwithelliot.com, sign up for this. The tickets are going to go fast. There's not unlimited space. And I'm going to be pushing this hard, and so is Rich. So sign up today. Use Hulse 10, and then uh, I'll find out who you are. I'll contact you personally, and I've got some special gifts for you. Rich, tell my audience how they can get in touch with you. Websites, Instagram, YouTube. you got a podcast I've been on twice. Yep. Where can they find that stuff? So all that stuff can be reached from our website, which is fullspectrumwarriors.com, fullspectrumwarriors.com. And uh, the podcast, if you want to search it, again, you can get to it from the website, but it's the Full Spectrum Warriors podcast. Uh, on Instagram, it's FSW Inc. is our community page. My personal page on there is Full Spectrum Warrior USA. Uh, maybe that's a mouthful to try to remember that. So best thing you can do is just go to fullspectrumwarriors.com. You can look for the links to YouTube, Instagram, uh, the podcast and whatnot. And, um, you know, you can get with us there if you want to come train. We have public courses we have private training experiences, which is what I really like to do is you get to come with a small group of friends or if your family, you can come out to our ranch, stay in our cabin for a few days, nice. or whatever, and just do customized training for you. Or you can train with us online. We have some training tutorials and whatnot on our online university. So if, if you can just train from home or whatever on some of the fundamentals, but you can check that out. It's all there on fullspectrumwarriors.com. Rich, thank you, brother. Awesome.